go back to my room <laughs> and I will come back to it. The bus has been booked at uh, 1 o'clock most likely. So he might continue because I've taken up few minutes. Uh, I can finish by half if you want. No, I mean uh, you go on. I mean till 12, 12 40 you can easily do 12 40 45. So there's not a problem. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I can come in and disturb you with some signs and update you about the situation. Sure. Okay, so welcome everybody to the first lecture of um, this young course on the evolution of wireless communications uh, towards 5G. So um, the, the module is structured into four subparts. So the first one is pretty much of an introductory kind. So we're going to spend three lectures on that. Then the rest of this week is uh, basically going to cover some aspects that are relevant for uh, modern wireless systems in uh, from the physical layer viewpoint okay so digital signal processing uh, and the likes and then next week we are going to dive deeper into system level considerations and uh, how you do radio resource management um, for modern systems and also something to do with topology so the the structure of the nodes deployment uh, itself and then the last uh, four lectures um, are going to be about uh, some more recent developments in the uh, on the theoretical side. So not necessarily coupled with 5G, they are of general uh, use. And uh, so that's kind of the more, let's say, futuristic part of the course. And um, as Professor Das said, we will have four paper clubs, right? So the first one, I think, is on Wednesday. Um, and I think try to select these papers based on the relevance to the course and also on their quality, okay? They are supposed to be uh, tutorial kind of papers. So, I mean, they are scientific papers, but they are kind of, you know, qualitative in nature. So you will, you will see some equations, but they are not like transactions, okay? Uh, so the idea is basically to give you some high level, but still high quality view on, on the four parts sort of the course, um, three, four parts and to discuss them together. So what I'm thinking for those tutorials, uh, we're going back to that, but it's basically, okay, of course you should read them in advance, not up to the last minute, hopefully the day before at least. Uh, it shouldn't take too long, okay? I think it's something you can manage in a couple of hours, hopefully, two, three hours. And then since you're v many, uh, what I'm thinking um, is to form maybe something like 10 groups, okay? Eight to 10 groups, it's completely up to you, okay? How to form them. and to elect one uh, group leader. These, by the way, these groups and these leaders can change, okay, from paper club to paper club, but essentially it's up to you how you want to organize this. And this is just for the sake of having some structure in the interaction. So what I'm thinking is um, maybe the first half of this tutorial session, which is about one hour, one hour something, would be about you discussing with your team about your view. Okay, of course, you, re you read the paper individually, but then together you might discover some new insights, clarify each other doubts, uh, have ideas. And then the second half of the, um, of the session would be the team leaders interacting mostly with me. It's open, of course, to everybody else. And then it would be more reporting what are your views, and then I'll tell you what are my views, and hopefully we'll, we'll convene to some common understanding and, and ideas. Uh, and ideally, ev everything we do in this course is not for the sake of passing an easy exam. I already told you the exam is easy, right? So it shouldn't be your main focus. Your main focus should be to learn and hopefully use some of this to start your own activities. Now, uh, regardless, you are, uh, you know, a PhD student or a more senior uh, academic, or you are actually not in academia at all and you're doing some research. Hopefully, it would give you some food for thought. Okay, and that's that's the main purpose. So. That's why we go back to the uh, course being very interactive. 
So you should take the science class questions in class, after class, by email, you know, and do not be constrained by the actual duration of the course. Um, I'm very much, uh, you know, open to discuss things beyond the course if you're interested. And, you know, I don't know if you are supervising somebody or doing a project and you want to discuss uh, even possible collaborations. I don't know. I'm very open, okay? So um, now without further ado, I'm going to, um, you know, uh, start with the course proper. So the first lecture is supposed to be a bit of a dive in the past. Um, it's good to take stock of what has been done before, before moving ahead, okay? So that's the idea behind this. Um, this lecture and of course as we understand this we are going to discuss something like uh, uh, in the order of 35 years of development 30 to 40 say so it's not that I can tell you everything but I, I will give you some glimpse of what was the idea behind the first generation we are talking about 5g now so how about 1g 2g 3g and 4g hmm? okay so the generations have actually um, uh, spanned uh, through, as I said, uh, something like 40 years, you could say, because uh, the rule of thumb is like every 10 years you have a new generation, okay? It's not written in stone, and there is no, no actual law that obliges us to do that, but it seems uh, that the pattern that is emerging is that every 10 years there is enough meat, enough uh, disruption in the field of, of mobile communication to warrant the definition of a new generation itself. It's not something that you is only, you know, of telecom. For example, if you think of uh, uh, nuclear power plants, they do have their generations. And, you know, I'm pretty sure you could say that for uh, many fields in, uh, of engineering, right? So, and um, I don't think there is anything really uh, very formal about it. Uh, part of the story is like this technical. Uh, side of the story so y y the system is so different so better hopefully than the former one that you can't call it the same right it's like HDTV you can't call it like uh, cathodic uh, uh, like tube TV right it's something else another thing is marketing of course we are doing this for profit uh, in the end okay so to sell products so it's also a way to, to kind of tell okay I'm doing a better job now so you should go back to the shop and buy a new Handset, okay, yeah. So that's these are the two reasons, in my opinion, um, why this is happening. A third one, maybe it's not so you know nice to say, but it's also f uh, fashion, right? You want to give the impression, right, that uh, things are changing, and so we are going back to this. So sometimes, in my opinion, uh, it's also a bit of a game this generation, okay. And for example, what happened between 4G and 5G? It's not so straightforward to me that it guarantees this new generation definition. Some other times it does, okay? But just okay, keep an open mind uh, about this thing. So the first generation was about mobile phones, okay, mobile voice. If I go back to my, um, you know, childhood, um, now I am, um, there's no problem in disclosing that, I am uh, turning 40 this year, so later uh, this year. So when I was a child, we go back 30 years, more or less, um, I don't think anybody had a mobile phone, okay? Pretty much, it was such a cool thing, okay? There was the coolest kid in the school having a mobile phone, which was something like that. That big, heavy, totally unreliable, uh, and it was actually way better to use your fixed phone, okay, to do, <laughs> to do phone calls. But it was so cool that you could actually travel around and do not be bound to find actually even a box where you had to, right, uh, insert coins. And so it was definitely a big, a big shift, okay? It gave you, it kind of opened the door to a world of, of, of many possibilities, right? Mobility, wireless itself is, is freedom, okay? That's the main thing. So even though it wasn't really that great, it was so good to have such a possibility that, you know, it became one of the big biggest shifts in the, uh, essentially in the way people work and interact with each other along with the appearance of personal computers. They kind of appear, I think personal computers appeared a bit before, but we are talking about the same, same time. So if you go back, actually a very good history of exercise is to go back to movies from that period and see how the technology has changed. So there is a very famous movie, Wall Street, I think, Gordon Gecko, right? The famous like uh, broker, right, in Wall Street and it's kind of, in a sense, uh, incarnating all that is bad about finance, right? And uh, 
and that were the, in a sense. But the, the interesting thing is that the, the mobile phone the guy uses is something like like that, right? So. Um, now, the second generation started to acknowledge it's not just about making phone calls. If not, we are better off using the more reliable fixed phone, in a sense. But you could also do things like uh, short messaging service, right? S sending SMS. So that, again, was another big change um, in the way we, we communicate because it, it kind of emphasized, the, in a sense, the speed over the depth, okay? Which led to many uh, repercussions, right? In, in, in nowadays, we even have the you know, big politicians, big stars, they communicate via Twitter. In a sense, SMS is like the uh, presenter, right? The ancestor of Twitter and, and social media. So uh, one thing is that still the technology was relying on what has been there for a while, which is PSTN, the public switch telephone network, which is like the, the one we still use for our fixed phones. So there wasn't really anything very fancy about the technology in terms of the network. Okay, definitely the handset, the, 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 the devices changed a lot, but the network kind of stayed the same, okay? Um, now, what has happened in the, in the next uh, generation, so the bridge to 3G was actually that you, you started to support packet switch network. Okay, not fully integrated yet, but you started to have things that used the, um, the IP protocol, okay, and using the, the packets instead of, of circuits. Okay, so which is way more flexible, also more complicated. So you don't have to set up a circuit in the beginning, right? Uh, actually, there are many different possibilities for you to deliver a message. Okay, so you need more intelligence in the network because you have to be capable of uh, re rearranging packets, um, coping with l uh, loss of packets, and, and stuff like that. The more you, 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 the more time passes, the more the game becomes intricate, uh, both in terms of engineering and in terms of the things people get used to. So there is this kind of, uh, well, might be virtues or vicious, I don't know, cycle between what you experience and what you expect, right? So what you experience is the job of the people in this room, is like designing the network, but that is fed to the, um, to the users uh, who get used to something better uh, every year, basically. So they, they ask for that in the next product. They are not going to settle down to compromise for anything less. Right, so and then that's a new set of requirements for the engineers to to satisfy. So also this game of the generation is about this interaction between the end user and the technologist. Hmm? So higher data rate is just a part of the story, but it's pretty much the, this this story up until 4G, getting faster speed. So how many bits of information you can deliver over time? That's it. That's all we've been optimizing up until 5G, really, okay? Um, what is a bit, at the very basic uh, level, it's like the uh, possible, um, the information uh, associated with answering a yes or no question, tossing a coin, right? Two options, equally likely. That's what a bit is. Mm? So it doesn't even have to do with wireless communication, to be honest. Now, that's subject for another course, but. What I find also so beautiful in our field is that it's like much more than it looks like, right? It's like a person that, mm, okay, you say, not so, yeah, okay, fine. But then when you get to know the person, wow, you say, this, this person is amazing, right? So, and I think our field is a bit like that. So, for example, the, the theoretical developments uh, due to information theory and Shannon have been applied immensely to, you know, have been applied to things that have nothing to do literally with, with wireless and, and telecom. Um, so. This is a bit uh, the story. So anyway, it's very noble, the concept of bit, but in the end, it's very simple what we try to do. So don't load as many uh, of such bits in a reliable way over time. That's data rate, really, okay? So that's, that's pretty much the story up until 3G. So uh, we're going back, okay, to what 4G did uh, a bit different, and, and, and that will get us you know, up and running and set for 5G. So the first generation is actually, it came in two flavors. Um, first of all, this is kind of not there. Uh, as far as I know, last time I checked, there might be some operational system in Africa. I'm not even sure they're there because I checked a few years ago. Uh, but it's essentially not really op operational anymore. Very different story for 2G and 3G, okay? Uh, they are still kind of very much present uh, worldwide. Um, so the, um, they both use frequency division multiple axes, which means 
they do guarantee access to multiple mobile phones um, to communicate with the network using different frequencies. Mm? Um, you see, so there are different uh, versions of it depending on the, um, on the part of the world. So for example, there was a European version which is called ETAC and US and let's say more Asian version which is called AMPS. That's something we are going to see changes with time. So in the beginning, standard didn't have the ambition to be global. The first guy that had this ambition in terms of, of generations was 2G. And GSM, you know what G stands for? It's the first time, OK? That, again, the words have a meaning. The words are not just random combinations of letters. Now, maybe if you listen to some politicians, that might be what you guess. But in general, the um, the words convey the meaning, okay? There is a plan behind the word. So even if you check this course, if you check finalize word by word, there is already a plan, right? Kind of, uh, at least a potential plan. So the global part of the story came up very strongly with 2G, but 1G is not about that. 1G is about, you know, getting it to work essentially. Um, okay, now one question, I, it's a bit technical, but I think it's kind of enlightening if you get it right. So. What do you notice if you check, here you see uplink it basically when you communicate from the mobile phone to the access point, base station, or no matter how you call it, it's like the point of attachment to the network, right? We are talking in this course, by the way, about mostly about the radio link, the wireless link. The network is possibly 99.99% .99 more than that. The network is whatever is beyond also, right? This point of access. But we focus on the radio one because it's challenging and you know you have mobility, you have a um, very, very variable environment, you don't have a guide like you have in optical fiber communication. So there are a lot of challenges that guarantee, that you know, that justify why so many people work on wireless alone. But physically it's just a tiny bit. Though many of the problems we have with the communication network are in this tiny bit, okay? Let's put things in context though. Wireless is just a, a portion of the story. So talking about this wireless bit, when we communicate from the mobile phone to the point of attachment, we call it uplink. Why? Again, the words have a meaning, uplink, going up. Normally, the mobile phone, the device, is at a lower height than the point of attachment. There is a good reason for that. Downlink, going down, from the point of attachment to the mobile phone. Now, that's not always true. You might be, right, if you use your phone on a plane, of course, that's, uh, that's not true. But in general, this is correct. Why is the point of attachment at a higher height? Because you need to clear the site. It's like when you, when you have these people, the scouts for the army, right? They climb and then they check things or on the ship, right? It's because you need to have a clear um, line of sight, essentially, to check things. And this is the same with radio, really. That's why you tend to put things at the highest point, rooftops. Uh, you will never put your access point uh, right uh, underneath the table and so on, and again, there is a reason. So why are these frequencies different? So why, uh, well, they're different because we need one for uplink, one for downlink, that's the point of FDMA, but why is the uplink frequency at a lower frequency range? And that's true invariantly of the system. When you have frequency division-based systems, FDD, you will always have this. You will have uplink at a lower frequency, downlink at a higher frequency. Check it, okay? You can just go and Google and check different uh, different frequency plans, it's always going to be like that. Oh. Why do you think it's so? Yeah. Power. 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 Yeah. In the, the uplink, the mobile handset has got a power limitation. Correct. And how does it help to be at a lower frequency? The downlink, the more power can be generated, and in the lower frequency yeah. band, the propagation losses are less. Very good. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're already halfway through the exam, I think. Yes. <laughs> no. Be very good. Yes. That, that's exactly true. So you see, again, engineers are smart people normally, right? And so they tend to do things with a purpose. It's not that they, you know, toss a coin. There is a very solid technical reason, uh, uh, and that's exactly the reason your colleague was was mentioning. Okay. Good. Now, second generation, global, global. Now, another sign is that in the beginning, people didn't care too much about the language they were language. I mean, human language. Okay. So, the original meaning, the original sorry. Um, um, acronym was in French, as far as I know, and it was called something like Global Special uh, Mobile, uh, something like that. Now, at some point, so the global was there, but it wasn't really the global language, right? Now, that's why I'm 
I'm Italian, but I'm teaching in English now, right? And maybe your mother tongue is not English, but you're attending a course in English because people agreed that's the language, right? To be used for science as before it was German, French, Latin, if you go back in the past, and probably other languages in this part of the world. But English is the language. So again, global is not just a wishful thinking, it's, it's a plan, okay? You want to go global, so the, fa the very fact that they change the standard, uh, the standard, the generation name using English is, is a signal. And, uh, uh, and ever since, English was the thing. You will never see acronyms anymore uh, nowadays. In, um, you, you will not see acronyms in, in other languages than English. Okay? UMTS, uh, LTE, they are all in English. But again, we might, have, we might think this, this was always there. It's not true. Actually, from 2G onward, it became really the story. They use TDMA now. Now there are reasons to use frequency or time to, to, to schedule your users, okay, your, your mobile phones to communicate with the access uh, point, but um, I'll use access point in a very relaxed way. Uh, it's mostly, I mean, it's true that traditionally this is a Wi-Fi terminology, but to me uh, it's going to be the point of access, okay? So it could be a low power base station, it could be a relay, it could be a base station it could be a Wi-Fi access point. So when I say access point, think broadly, okay? I'm not just talking about Wi-Fi. So you use TDMA, develop, now huge success, develop worldwide, uh, almost in 200 counties, still very popular nowadays. You do have a lot of people still use um, DSM uh, and countries. Um, and actually, you, you also have a version in US so you still have this, uh, though they claim to be global, you still have this kind of competitor. We are going to see that this is resolved with um, 4G. You don't really have this kind of two branches of standards anymore. But still, here we have the version based on CDMA, so codes here are used to guarantee access. Now, the things get more complicated and more abstract. You don't just use time and frequency, which are physical resources. You start to use things you made up, codes, okay? Codes do not exist in nature. It is a man-made uh, thing. And you would assign these artificial codes to different users to communicate. It's like a password that only you have and the others wouldn't have, right? And you use this to access the medium. So things get, start to get more complicated. Um, you do have different bands. Now in general, sorry. In general, these bands are uh, kind of low. If you consider like the electromagnetic spectrum is hugely broad, right? So you do have, uh, now people talk about uh, transmission in the in carriers that are in the order of tens of gigahertz. People talk about terahertz, which is thousand gigahertz, right? You do have actually your uh, modest uh, TV remote control, which uses infrared, so higher still. And then you start to see Li-Fi, light fidelity, right? Uh, where they use uh, visible light communication, higher still, and so on and so forth. Then you go to astronomy, right, where you have uh, gamma rays and those kind of things. So, but you see, so it's hugely broad. So if you just look at it, what we are using, it's really a tiny portion of it. Hmm? So normally we are using something which is below six gigahertz, possibly below three gigahertz. Hmm? And we normally don't start at zero, though we could, right? We could start at zero. Actually going uh, after your colleague comment, why not use a zero? If it's so true that and it is true that at lower frequency, the signal propagates further away in space. Why don't you use the uh, direct uh, component? You should, right? So there are reasons and uh, why we don't do that. I'm going back to that. And there is also a reason why we are not going so high up because of attenuation and other things like the signal becomes very sensitive to blockages. We are going back to this later in the course when I'm going to talk about millimeter wave. Um, but essentially the problem when you go high up in frequency is the channel becomes very unreliable. Literally things like uh, doing this would disrupt your channel. Okay, if you have a person passing by, problem. Um, the advantage of going high up in frequency is the band. Because also, also because it's so not appealing, nobody cares, you have a lot of bandwidth, okay. Um, so the data rate could potentially go very high, but you have to be, you know, making sure that you, you, you have a reliable channel. So it's understood. We don't go that, that high up in frequency because uh, of the physics. Now, also because of the physics, we, we don't go down to the direct component. 
Anybody telling me what goes wrong if you go very down in frequency? So if you see TV channels, they cover a country, so they're, they're supposed to be very long range, and in fact they use lower uh, frequencies than cellular systems. They use something in the order of hundreds of megahertz, yeah? And why not 10 kilohertz? That's one problem. Uh, there is another problem, actually, which is more physics than engineering now. Anybody? What happened? You start to get actually reflections from the ionosphere. So you start to get uh, bounces, you know, of, uh, which are weird by the very at atmospheric nature of, of the planet. Okay, so uh, yeah, antennas are a big thing, but it's also like the, the nature of, 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 the, um, of the propagation is not really good. So they, they, call, about, they call this 300 to 3,000 megahertz the sweet spot. Yeah, so that's why invariantly you would have all of these cellular systems using this, uh, this part of the spectrum, which led to interesting results on its own because because everybody's using that, then people started to talk about cognitive radio spectrum sharing, uh, these kind of things. Because you needed, you needed to become smarter in the way you coexist and you use a shared resource. Okay, that, that's the motivation why we had this, this huge amount of work last decade mostly on cognitive radio, for example. Okay, so things go on. Uh, any questions so far or comments? Nope. So feel free to, to tell me. Okay. Um, yeah, just a bit about the, this bridge tour between second and third generation. So you, st you, you will see that data rates keep on going up. Peak data rates, that is the maximum rate you can achieve if only one user is served. This is not what everybody gets. If you get more users, they will have to share this capacity. Yeah, so this is like the peak. And peak means if everything goes all right. We are not talking about the situation where a lot of stumbling blocks are around, you know, and uh, the channel is nasty. This is the best possible thing. So what, what one of the professors said in the beginning, in the inauguration, is very correct. That people claim that's the rate of 4G, for example, right? Or 5G, they will claim something else. But that's kind of, uh, it's nothing else than a commercial. It's if you are alone, close to the transmitter, ideal situation, that's where you're going to sit. Guess what? It's never going to be the case. That's why people complain, oh, it's not what you told me. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's good to take this course. Next time you, you'll, be, you'll be negotiating better with your provider, okay? Um, but, you know, things got better. So even if, let's say, let's say that this is maybe not true and you, at best you get 50% of this, 30% of this, still proportionally, the rate a user will see increases with time. That's true, okay? You couldn't possibly even start to think about watching videos on a, on a well, 2G phone. First of all, because it's not meant for that, but also, the, the, the technical capability, you know, to sustain such rate wouldn't be there anyway, even if you had the network, say, uh, that, that could do it. More and more quality of service becomes a concern. So you don't just want it to work when, when the phone likes it to work, you want it to work when you like it to work. So you, you basically have to, you, you want the, um, the reliability to be there. You want to be guaranteed that most of the time it's going to work, not just now and then, yes? Um, so that implies some things also in terms of the 5G network, you know, and we're going back to that. So you do have this mixture of circuit and packet switch, as we said, and combining different slots. That's the good thing about time. It doesn't take too much hardware. You just transmit over different slots in time and you can aggregate throughput. It's also good to control the power. I switch on, I switch off, no problem. The good thing about time is that it's very, very cheap to use. Okay, just wait. Uh, frequency is different because frequency is a hardware component. When you say about switching frequencies and uh, you know aggregating channels, it's becoming complicated. Okay, and that's why a lot of the work was done to to comply with this cognitive radio, smart radio, in terms of software-defined radio. You want to push things to software because you can be more flexible, uh, but in, you still have a hardware bit, and frequency in general associates with hardware. Okay, time doesn't. Of course, time has a price to pay, which is, uh, we, we always say time is money, which is true. So if you, if you are abusing time too much, you give up on latency. And that, that goes back to quality of service. So just trying to give you some you know, preview of 5G. A big thing in 5G is not just data rate, it's latency. You want to have things that are, I mean, let's say, 
the time between the request of information and the time you, you actually get information on your phone should be less than one millisecond, which you can't achieve if you start to use time as a dimension too much, because that means you're adding delay, right? So for example, if you have to, to repeat the, the transmission of a packet like uh, ARQ, automatic repeat request protocols, people are a bit uh, sensitive about using them for these low latency services because you see, they're not meant for that, okay? Because they they're for more relaxed time constraints. So all of these, you know, make sense in... Uh, around the, uh, yes, around. yeah, there are questions about whether that, uh, I think it's an insane definition if you really take it generally because you see every time you go to a data center, you cannot do it in one millisecond. So I think it's mostly meant for the kind of adds part of the network, right? But in, they would, I mean, if you ask these, these guys that talk about URLLC, they do not distinguish between this. So they say, okay, anytime you ask for information, you get it. But of course, that's, that might be just wishful thinking. I think if you, go, if you have to go, you know, deeper into the core network, then you cannot do that, right? And there are, there are also things to do with speed of light, right? Because you can't go faster than, than something. So we, we, then, then, then some limit. So by this round trip, yes, yeah, like both ways. Good, now third generation. Uh, again, we do have unfortunately two branches, US versus the rest of the world, more or less, uh, simplifying things. Um, you start to use higher bandwidth, so you start to use larger portions of spectrum. Uh, does the Shannon capacity equation ring a bell? Yes, where is the bandwidth in that equation? It appears, it multiplies the logarithm, right? What does it mean? Yeah, and what does it mean to have more bandwidth then? It's good, right? This is linearly, right? Uh, well, up to some point, because then you have the noise kicking in, but let's say within a reasonable range of bandwidth, you get a linear relation between throughput capacity and and the bandwidth, so it's good. That's why people are after more bandwidth. By the way, cognitive radio spectrum sharing, they all rely on this, on this knowledge, right? Okay, so you use CDMA or variants of it, uh, even in US, and again, you see rates keep on going up. You start to see more and more focus on data. Hmm? It's not just about SMS. You want actually to have, uh, you had MMS at some point, and then definitely browsing, emailing, right? All of this was already available on 3G phones, yeah. Now, one story about 3G is that it wasn't too well thought um, of by engineers because they thought how cool we could be technically. They didn't bother uh, to dare their hands and interact with users, which is a very bad thing if you are selling things. And in fact, they came up with great products nobody wanted. So um, a lot of people still were kind of okay with 2G phones, okay? And uh, so they didn't make a very good case. Now, they, they, it took them longer than expected to return to have a return on, on, on their investment, okay? And that's why at some point they even pushed back a bit the 4G release, though they were kind of there to kind of, you know, get their money back in a sense. So uh, 4G a bit better, 5G I see, I have mixed feelings. I still see people doing things just because they're cool, which is a very, I wouldn't say stupid, but not so, um, uh, you know, not so, uh, well thought uh, approach because eventually we might do science of course but eventually we have to apply it and to make it a business case that's what you know engineering is about in the end and telecom is no exception so for example I am doing myself some work on uh, starting to do some work on this ultra reliable low latency uh, service in 5G URLLC with this one millisecond right uh, delay and maybe four nines, five nines reliability. So it means you want the system to be reliable 99.9999% of the time. And I couldn't find a single person agreeing on at least a couple of services that definitely need that. It is not such a good sign in my opinion, but, but it, it's coming up. So I think there are things like surgery, maybe remote surgery, possibly some emergency transportation things, like you have cars moving as a platoon and you have to brake, right, in a way to avoid accidents. Or maybe, you know, you have traffic safety. You have a pedestrian, like a kid, jumping into the street. 
and then of course the car has to stop immediately, right? So I, I see some applications for this ultra low latency, but I don't see it across the board as they want us to believe maybe. So keep a critical mind about, about things, uh, okay, always. Especially when it comes from big um, corporation presentations. That, yeah, so just you know, as an academic, uh, we have to be critical okay, about things. Especially when you have to decide what to work on, what your lab should work on, and these are kind of critical management decisions. Even if you're a PhD student, you have to decide you know, something that hopefully would be useful to others after you're done, not just granting your PhD, something that is good science, good, good engineering. And if you just follow the blindly the herd, that might bring problems down the line. Hmm? So you should at least do some thinking whether we really need to solve this problem, not just because they told you so. Okay. Good. Fourth generation, getting closer to the point of the course, right? So um, what do we have? All IP networks. I mean, again, on paper. I'm not too sure that's a practical thing, but that's the real thing. But eventually they wanted, they had this, this idea that we shouldn't have an internet system. We shouldn't have a PSTN system. We should just have one communication infrastructure and pretty much make use of internet as much as we can, okay? Uh, things like um, uh, voice over IP, okay? Best example I think I can come up with. And uh, then nowadays you have um, on-demand uh, content delivery like Netflix, right? You can watch on your phone too. Uh, so these are all things that uh, are, are relying on, the, on this IP, all, all IP kind of network, right? Quality of service is still not completely resolved because there's still issues in getting the quality or promise, but I don't know, people are getting there. Again, words are important. Long-term evolution, what does it mean? First of all, long-term. It's not something we, we want to, you know, to have to change in, in two months. Long-term, you know, it's been there. The first time I, I heard about long-term evolution was probably end of, well, actually mid of the last decade. And still, it's there, right? You have this 3GPP. LTE, which is pretty much in charge of 5G, uh, a good chunk of it. So at some point they were tired to start from scratch every time. So this story I told you about UMTS was about that. Okay, forget about 2G, let's do the best system ever. And then it was very difficult for them to justify the investment, okay? And then I said, okay, we're not going to do this mistake again. Now we are going to use what we can of 3G, make the upgrades we need, and that will be the story from now on. So that's why it started to be called long-term evolution. Hmm? Not the revolution, evolution. Before the revolutionary approach was much more, uh, you know, the, like uh, the, the, the way to go. Evolution has now become the way to go, mm? at least in terms of the major players in the telecom business. Mm? Uh, another thing, uh, I, 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 I heard uh, talks about uh, ad hoc networks replacing cellular networks when I was doing my PhD. So not ages ago, we're talking, what, 10 to 15 years ago? It's the time span away where I did my PhD. You wouldn't hear this anymore, okay? You would not hear things like, okay, forget about base station, cellular networks, that's the past. No, that's there. You will use it as much as you can. If you need to add things like relays, low power base stations, machine to machine, uh, things, industrial IoT, you do it, but you are still going to use the cellular network because it's there, it's working fine it's been working forever, okay? So these things are gone. So this, this approach about designing new networks from scratch is not viable, it's not smart. So same story with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi has been there, it is there, it's working. People like it, they love it actually, right? Everybody uses Wi-Fi. So if I am a cellular operator, I'm not going to get rid of Wi-Fi, I'm going to leverage Wi-Fi to help me maybe. Maybe I can offload my users, right? Maybe I can have an agreement with, uh, with, with that part of the, of the ecosystem, right? Of, of the telecom business ecosystem. Um, okay, so that, that this integration is pretty much there. And, and you do have what we call heterogeneous networks. So the things have changed quite a bit also in terms of the architecture or, or, and um, what we call the topology. So essentially where the um, access points are positioned in the network and what is the range. That's what we mean by topology in, in, in wireless. So in, in um, up to 3G, it was pretty much a very homogeneous story. So you had 
kind of regularly spaced, more or less, base stations, okay? And that's it. Then if you are within that area, you are taken care by uh, that base station, that access point. If you move somewhere else, they will hand you over to that new access point. Now, the thing is, uh, that didn't really do the job for, for example, indoor, okay? Or didn't do the job for very densely, uh, d very dense environments in terms of people, crowded. You couldn't just have this base station, I don't know, let's say in Karapur Railway, taking care of everybody here, especially if you have a festival, if you have a, a commencement ceremony, you cannot do that, okay? So it, it won't be enough, uh, okay? It's too far, it's, it's, it's not enough capacity. So they started to talk about relays, small cells, so kind of sort of the Wi-Fi philosophy applied to cellular systems. So you have this more local area uh, uh, points of access, which are low power, but they're very close. Okay, so they can actually provide um, a, good, a good quality of service. Hmm? We're going back to the story about the um, distance. You see, no matter how smart you, you are, you cannot beat physics. So the best thing is always to be closer to your transmitter, which is, shouldn't be surprising, right? So if you can, on average, be closer as a receiver to the transmitter, that's the best thing to do. That's why topology and these heterogeneous networks, so combinations of these macro base stations and smaller cells is very, very important. It's been subject of huge amount of research in the last 10 years, huge. Probably the most popular topic since cognitive radio. Hmm? Okay. So this I, I told you a bit, I think, uh, the, you see it was in France in the beginning, GSM, then it became uh, like they used English, it became more more global. You have pairs of duplex channels, so you have one channel for uplink, one for downlink. You, you always have to have pairs, right? You need something for downlink, something for uplink. Uh, discontinuous transmission, so if the mobile phone is not really active, it will shut down. No, that's not what people tend to do nowadays because of they, al they, they have this always on, low latency kind of uh, idea in mind. So things have moved more and more toward being always on. Maybe low power, maybe, you know, just kind of in a slip mode, but you're not going to be actually um, turning off your transmitter if you are not using the phone. That's not happening nowadays anymore. So the architecture, I, I would say there is similarity between the different generations. So you do have the radio part, okay, with the point of access. It's called base transceiver station in 2G, mobile station. So they have their own names. Now, even the naming has stopped at some point. The name changing because of this idea about evolution. So if you check, that's another sign, okay? that things were different before philosophically. So 1G, 2G, 3G, they all have different names for the same thing, essentially. From 4G onward, done. That's not the case, okay? They kind of uh, stick to one uh, terminology, so to speak. Um, so you do have actually the, what I was saying before. So they, you have the radio part, which is kind of the marginal part of the network, the edge part. And then you have something which has to do with the, um, you know, fixed part of the cellular network. So you do have your registers. For example, they check um, roaming, handover, this kind of things, okay? Uh, authentication, right? Uh, security things. Um, and then things were going into the public switch telephone network. So the normal landline phone network, yes? So that's the story about 2G um, architecture. So the rates, uh, so we're going to talk about UMTS architecture in a second. So the rates, again, you see there has been uh, a big jump. Even if, even if this is peak, this is ideal, still proportionally, you will get something that has to do with this number as a user. So you do have actually, what? This is thousand, this is a million. So you have three orders of magnitude in little more than five years. Okay? That's what has happened with, uh, with 2G to 3G. Um, yeah, so UMTS, um, you have this new technology, which is called uh, code division, multiple access. Essentially what you do, you create codes uh, in different ways. One way is to use the Adamard matrix. So you have these uh, binary trees. So you kind of, it's a very simple thing. I gave it as an exercise to my undergrad. So there's not, nothing too, too fancy about it. But you come up basically eventually with, with codes that are orthogonal. What does it mean for a code to be orthogonal? It means if you take the 
scalar product, the, the inner product between two codes, it has to be zero. How is it? For example, let's say your code is based on plus and minus one. If I have plus one, plus one, and you have plus one, minus one, we are orthogonal. Because if you do the component-wise multiplication and you sum, it gives zero. Pretty much, that's the story, okay? It's a very simple application of, of geometry, okay? Of, of um, vector spaces property. So they use this to provide a new dimension. So instead of actually sharing the frequencies, what if, uh, so instead of actually splitting the frequencies, what if we share them? Because we, we understand it's important to use as much spectrum as possible because of the Shannon capacity equation. So that's one reason why CDMA systems came about. Another reason they have good properties in terms of uh, narrow band interference resistance and jamming rejection because the way they work, they actually spread the signal which is originally in a small uh, bandwidth over a much larger bandwidth, right? Can be even 10 times larger or stuff like that. Uh, and essentially that means you are more and more like noise looking, which means the bad guy would have troubles in, in um, catching you, right? In, uh, understanding what's going on because to him would just be kind of noise. That's one thing. Another thing, if you have like some very localized in frequency interference, you would not bother much because it would just disrupt a bit of your bandwidth. So there are some good reasons to go for this. But the main one I think is like, um, because CDMA was originally a military application, they really cared about not being jammed or uh, uh, right uh, intercepted by enemies, I think. And then, of course, then it got applied to to the civil uh, uh, world, right? Okay, um, so that's the story. Handoffs start to be there very prominently and smarter versions of it. So you have what we call soft. So basically you're never going to be, so we don't have this concept of the discontinuous transmission. Let's just put the guy in, um, in a slip mode. We don't care about that. We are becoming better, more efficient. We don't need to do that. We always want the mobile phone to be kind of operational. So the minute we do handover, some, there has to be, so if we kind of go uh, out of reach of one base station, another one should take care of it. We, don't, we cannot wait for the other guy to be there. So we, we kind of keep the first link still active. That's what soft and over is. So the minute we are going out of reach, the other guy is already ready to take us over. It's like you are getting a new boss in the job and the former boss is training the new boss for a period normally, right? I mean, ideally. So you don't have any disruption and the new guy is lost, right? That's similar to what happened with soft handoff. You even have versions like softer handoff where you have, uh, you might actually have one base station with multiple sectors. So within the same access point, you might have this um, story, okay? Good. Uh, yeah, again, the architecture is pretty much always the same. So you have the user equipment, which is called UE now, and that stayed, I think, also in LT. UTRAN, uh, which is the radio access network is mostly the focus of this course along with UE and then core network is basically routine switching and uh, you know um, inter-system handover when you are handed over to Wi-Fi this kind of things so it's always like that okay this is true for any generation you have the user you have the radio access network you have the rest of the network pretty much okay simplifying things a bit oops no that's not what I wanted to do Okay, um, so it's, it's again similar story, but what changes is now, of course, well, the naming, okay, now they call it Node B. Uh, the base station, UE, uh, radio, network controller, core network. The interfaces change. They, do, they, they did change, uh, so you have to standardize how you communicate information between functional entities of your system. What message can you assume the UE can exchange with the node B, the node B with the radio network controller, and so on. You have to know that. You cannot just come up with it on the fly. So you have to provide a way to message information and what information is available. For example, maybe it's about um, indicating whether there is an overload in the network, okay, to many users. Maybe it's about uh, channel quality estimation, okay. Is it a good channel? What can I do with this channel? Is it a bad channel? What can I do? So these kind of things have to be, we're not going so deep into the standards, but these are things that you have to engineer before operating the network. Okay. 
something with time we are good, I think I made another five to ten minutes and then I'll get off the hook for the first lecture. So, okay, now we start to go into closer to the business of, of this course, okay, the, the history class is almost over, we are going to start the telecom class. So the evolution of, uh, of networks into 4G relies on some assumptions, okay, more and more the United Nations entity for telecommunication, which is called IT, you, yeah, it's the International Telecommunication Union. So it's the organism of United Nations essentially taking care, right, of, of, of uh, telecom. They came up, they became, as, as time went by, they became nosier and nosier. They want to have a look, okay? They are not just happy with you doing whatever you want and making money. They have a social concern that this should satisfy the good of, of soci the, you know, society. So it should satisfy the, should better, okay, society somehow. So they, they came up with a series of, of requirements. Some were also business, okay, they came from the operators and vendors themselves, but some are also due to uh, United Nations, for example. So. Um, you have to cope with the fact that more and more people are using mobile phones in their daily life for entertainment or business or safety or health emergencies. You, I can't imagine living without a mobile phone nowadays, right? It's very, very, it would be very, very difficult, especially for people maybe that are in isolated areas. But even if you are in an urban area, it's the same, right? I don't think you, you can really work and live essentially without a mobile phone nowadays. Well. Maybe you could, but that's not the way it, it, it is, right? So, the, um, so there are things like uh, legacy networks should be used, not just abandoned, okay? So should work in cooperation with Wi-Fi. And of course, it cannot just work with the new customers using 4G. If some customers are using 2G and 3G, you should still be able to, to talk with them, right? And, and interact on the phone insofar as possible. Rates are going up, up because, because of the possibilities we have, but it's also the users want higher rates, basically to do more and more streaming, social network sharing, right, uh, of content and uh, on-demand videos and, and other things. Now you have these new things in 5G like augmented reality, virtual reality, right, they require a lot of bandwidth. And you have even more noble things, not just, you know, for the fun of it, you have things like brain-computer interfaces. So if you could prov provide a better, in terms of data rate, um, um, uh, wireless communication, um, you could, for example, have people that cannot move and, and speak, right? That's people that are immobilized. So you could actually enable them to live better by, by means of having a broader bandwidth uh, wireless, right? So there are some things, it's not just about watching fun videos, right? There, is, there are some things that actually uh, solve uh, very, very noble uh, problems, right? Okay, so the idea is to smoothly tra uh, transition to 4G, as we said, not revolution anymore, evolution if possible. Um, LTE, 4G LTE is like the um, engineering definition, engineering name, nickname if you want, of 4G. So LTE is like the nickname, uh, LTE is the nickname for 4G in terms of engineering. IMT Advance is the nickname for 4G in terms of uh, policy. So. United Nations would call the systems IMT Advance. So Professor Suvradas before pointed out that he said the name uh, that United Nations give, uh, gave to 5G, which is called IMT 2020. Okay, so there, keep in mind they're the same thing, it's just a different viewpoint. So just to sum, uh, sum up, I mean, what are the requirements in terms of the generation? So you see in the beginning, you don't even have requirements, okay? Uh, at some point, ITU starts to look more into that and of course if you don't have, if nobody forces you to do things as you might know if you are a teacher student will not do it so a good a good side effect of the fact that ITU was more formal about requirements was also the quality of the system which became better and better okay because you know you have to comply with something you're told yeah okay um, yeah I was partly lying when I said that LTE kind of was done and dusted with this multiple standard thing, but uh, kind of. They tried to do again the, from the US side the story of WiMAX, it didn't succeed. That's kind of dead uh, as far as I know. Um, well, it has some limited application, but not really, okay, not globally. So LTE is the thing now. So finally, we managed, if you look like this, 
uh, tree of the evolution of standards is more and more converging to one thing, which is now the 3GPP story. Now you say, okay, it's like a fairy tale and everybody lived uh, happily ever after. Not really, because now you have new things, like um, you have industrial IoT, machine to machine communication. Uh, again, you have a plethora of standards that come from their own community. And so the story is just, you know, we are just kind of going back to the same um, problem of, of a proliferation of standards. And it's just coming from a different angle this time, okay? So we kind of, when we thought we took care of Wi-Fi and everything, cellular, okay, good. Then you have IoT storming into the room, literally, okay? And changing the picture again. Hmm? So you do have, uh, just for IoT, I would say about 10 standards. So it's not resolved which one it is, and we have to integrate this with, with 5G, right? And, and then you add automation with their own standards. Uh, so again, okay, a lot of work to do. Now this graph, just to tell you how to read it. So the important, um, I mean, forget about the numbers, I don't remember them, but the, the message here is like how far these curves are. So basically it tells you the relative amount of subscriptions for different standards. Now this is outdated, so I think still it kind of gives the idea though. So you see 2G was very much the story up until uh, early this decade. And then when these curves start to depart from each other is when this guy becomes deployed. And the, the further away you are, uh, let's say in terms of the UMTS curve from GSM, it means the more subscriptions we have. So let's say that the distance between UMTS and GSM, roughly speaking, is the same at this point in time. So maybe 2015, it means that's the time where the 3G subscriptions uh, number overcame 2G for the first time. Mm? So not ages ago, a few years ago at best. Mm? So, and 4G, you see, okay, research done and dusted. We all know about that, but in terms of deployment, not really, it just started, right? The, so you see, it's probably taking still a while before the number of subscriptions of LTE over, overcome 3G and 2G. Now, take it a bit, with the benefit of doubt, because uh, again, this 2010, but I think roughly speaking, this is correct. And 5G would not be even on the chart. 5G would still be kind of overlapping with this curve because we don't have 5G deployments yet, right? So it's all in the papers and technical reports and software simulations and testbeds. We don't have a 5G system out there, so it would not even show on the radar here. Hmm? So just to tell you that, you know, it's not that, uh, especially GSM was a hugely successful system, super well designed, useful. It kind of opened the door to global telecommunication, okay? UMTS, I think, even better in terms of design, but in terms of business plan and in terms of actual adoption considerations, not as well thought as, as GSM. 4G is still early to say, we have to have the final numbers. And so I think it's, I have mixed feelings. I don't know if engineers really learned the lesson, okay, in terms of over-designing things. I think to put user in the loop, uh, we do put regulator in the loop because we have to. We almost never put user in the loop. And then they complain that operators cannot make profit nowadays. Of course, you don't even listen to them in the first place, right? So why should they buy your stuff? I mean, and... Uh, that's why now, by, 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 you know, but in the end you get what you deserve. So because of this kind of um, shallow consideration of users, that's why now you have over the top providers eating all, all the cake. Netflix, Skype, uh, these guys, they make a lot of money. And guess what? They invest zero, zero literally in infrastructure because they use, they ride, they piggyback what's already there. So the punishment for to not consider, let's say, the business cases carefully has been that somebody else came and, and ate the cake, okay? It's evolution, huh? Now, Darwinian evolution, right? Uh, the, the, um, the fetus survive, okay? So it doesn't look very nice at the moment for operators. No, I wouldn't like to call them, uh, you know, to, to, to declare them dead uh, until uh, proven uh, wrong. It doesn't look good, though. I mean, what, what happens is, like, it, it even impacts the way they invest and they research because they kind of, it's very difficult for them to justify the investment because of the errors in the past. So they try to be conservative. So you do have, for example, companies like Google, way more innovative 
uh, in terms of uh, wireless telecom wireless com nowadays than other you know traditional companies uh, and it's because of this because they are much lighter they do not own a network essentially they do not have to you know basically manage it they just use it okay and um, so there are actually discussions whether this is fair or not uh, but just to say you know that the, the picture is not so clear to me at the moment okay so could be that 5g is something we we can't really i mean the actual 5g you deploy something we can't really understand right now i think technology we do okay but the business side of the story is much less clear to me at least Okay, just to close this lecture, and then I, I have you, because you have to catch a bus. So basically, there are some numbers given by LT. Now, I'm not so you know, keen on going number by number, but rates are higher. You have to be backward compatible. You have both FDD and TDD. So the former generations, they kind of chose sites. LT, it's about evolution, so let's use everything across the board, okay? Um, Mobility now, well, I'm not sure they really achieve that, but you should be able to provide connectivity also if you're on a fast train, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and definitely the device is very heterogeneous in nature, phones, cameras, and, and, and stuff like that. Okay, so the features are, they use frequency division multiplexing, a, spe a specific version of it, which is orthogonal in nature, which leads to increased data rates because you decrease the inter-channel interference essentially. You take better care of the channel impairments. So there are some good reasons to do this and you simplify the receiver side with, in terms of equalization. Um, it claimed to be an all IP ar architecture, so very much moving toward the integration with the internet essentially. Okay, Reducing KPS and OPEX because you are trying to only deploy when needed. So that's why they went into these relay small cells. They didn't want to come up with the architecture from the scratch. They just say, okay, let's put patches. If we have a coverage problem, we just deploy a smaller base station, which doesn't cost us more than maybe 1,000 euro, instead of spending, you know, uh, I don't know, something like a million euro. Okay, so, and we just put it where we need. Spectrum flexibility is much, much uh, uh, in uh, the order, uh, you know, of, of the day. It's on the agenda for, for 4G. We are, not stuck, uh, get, we are not stuck with one band. We use all the bands that are available. Part of the story, re reusing the bands that weren't used by digital TV, what they call TV white spaces, um, interaction with Wi-Fi, um, Okay, and so any any time you can actually use a band, you, you do. And you try to re aggregate resources, which has implications in terms of the mobile phone. So you might use bands that are not exactly adjacent in the spectrum, which means the radio frequency part gets more complicated, okay? Uh, Architecture-wise, again, no big difference. The main, uh, apart from the naming compared to 3G, I think the main difference is a bit at the logical level, not the physical level. It's like, um, you tend to push more and more intelligence toward the edge. So the base station now becomes in charge of many things uh, that before were actually um, taken care by the, you know, something like deeper in the core network. So now the base station can do more things. It's more intelligent. Um, okay, now you might ask, is this the trend? So we are going to push intelligence to the edge. Yes and no. There are things like caching. Uh, they try to deliver the content and store it close to the user, similar to what LTE intends to do. But there are also approaches like Cloud Run, where, they, where things rely on the cloud, which is much more centralized, much more you know, in, in the deep part of the network. So again, it's both sides of the story. So LTE tried to push things to the edge pretty much, but it seems to me things are going also reversed a bit. Okay, so you have both trends uh, coexisting. Stop here unless there is any last question and because you have to catch a bus. Yes. The reduced uh, yes. Yeah, so CAPEX is capi capital expenditure. So it's essentially when you have to deploy new infrastructure. Okay, you deploy a new base station, for example. OPEX is the money you pay to uh, operate, to run the network. So for example, if you become more efficient in terms of energy, if you become more efficient in terms of um, you know, 
you, ha you have less need of a, of a person driving around to check the signal quality, right, where they do this uh, test driving. That's operational because you have the infrastructure in place. When you are deploying, deploying new things, that's um, capital. Okay? So it's, but they are trying to reduce both, becoming more efficient in many ways in terms of operation. With cognitive radio, for example, it's an attempt to do that. CAPEX is like, for example, instead of deploying new massive towers, they come up with this small cell concept, femtocell, they call it sometimes, relays. So things that are definitely not that expensive, okay? And it's just a patch. Maybe you have a concert, maybe you have a festival. You are not going to have a huge mast with uh, a huge uh, base station. You just go there with the van, with your small uh, base station. When you're done, you take it back. So these kind of things are good for capital because they reduce that part of the cost. Yeah? Yeah, I think guys, you should go and have lunch, and then we'll, no, there's an announcement. Done? Yep. So. so let's thank Professor Nicola for the first talk. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, I have some information.